Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to speak about the theory part of the paper, and the practical part of the paper will be presented by Asaf. However, as Chief Justice Barak told me once, is the saying, the best practical thing you can ever have is a good theory. And I truly believe in that, that only with a good theory you can really understand what are the goals and of the law and what is that that you are trying to, to achieve. Now, when we look in around the world, we get to see that there are many ownership structures around the world. You get to see dispersed ownership, you get to see concentrated ownership, you get to see dual class shares, you get to see many of them. And we know that in the UK and the US, the dominant form is dispersed ownership, while in Israel and Europe and Asia, the dominant form is concentrated ownership. But it doesn't mean that in all these places you don't get to see the other forms of ownership structure. It's just different proportion of them in different countries. But the form of concentrated ownership attracted uh, a lot of attention because for some reason it received bad reputation. And the reason for the bad reputation that, that was the starting point of the academic work was that when you hold a control block, it means that you're losing liquidity. It means that you are reducing diversification. So why do it? Why hold the block? And the main answer that was given to this, uh, to this question was bad private benefits of control. The controlling owner will exploit the minority, and the reason for holding the block is to expropriate the minority. And in other words, you, you would like to affect the distribution of the pie. That's how you would like to get compensated for losing liquidity and diversification. And along this line, the basic answer was we should improve minority protection as much as you can. Now, the problem with this view is that they have associated concentrated ownership with countries that have bad laws. Countries that have bad laws normally are dominated with concentrated ownership. And the explanation is because courts cannot prevent self-dealing and you can have a lot of transfer from minority to the controlling owners, that's why we do see those structures. However, there are many countries with excellent law and we still get to see concentrated ownership, even in the US, even in Sweden, which is the dominant form of concentrated ownership, and we still see that there. More than that, if you think about how private equities <coughs> firms are working, then many of them, even here in Israel, we do see them, they get control, they engage in zero self-dealing, they don't appoint any family members to the board, and they manage them purely for making business and make the exit with five, six, seven years along the term that they need to operate. So it can't be that this is the only explanation for concentrated ownership. It's true, it's there. I've been in office and I've seen that, that it does happen, but it's not the complete picture. Another explanation was given its monitoring. In fact, instead of relying in dispersed ownership on markets to monitor management, we have a controlling owner who takes that role to monitor the management. So here the motivation is to increase the size of the pie by providing a much better monitoring over management. However, in this story, the problem is if monitoring is the service, then monitoring is another cost. Monitoring is much like management. So you lose liquidity, you lose diversification, and you have to invest in monitoring. So the conclusion of those who promoted this argument was that we should allow some optimal level of private benefit of controls in order to compensate for that service. Somehow it doesn't make sense that the law should basically allow certain level of optimal private benefits of control. And the more problematic issue with this argument is why bundle 
owning a, corp a, a control block with monitoring. Why not separate the two, like we do see in dispersed ownership structure? In all, if this is what you need to give, board of directors are assigned with the role of monitoring management, and they don't have to hold a block. Uh, the answer that we are trying to give is a different one. We call it the idiosyncratic value of corporate control, meaning that you own a control block not because you want to expropriate the, the, the minority and not because you would like to provide a service of monitoring as such, but rather because you have some vision, you have some business idea that you would like to implement and you want to do it your own way. That's how you want to do it. And if you get the right to do it by owning the control, then if things go well and you make a lot of money, you will share it pro rata with the minority with no, without trying to extract higher part of, a greater part of this part. Now, an excellent illustration of this story is the story of Henry Ford. When Henry Ford exited Edison and he would he, he was trying to create the, the car. Then, when he started, he didn't hand, had any patent on producing cars, nor any intellectual property in any part of the production of cars, nothing whatsoever. He just had a strong conviction and belief that he knows how to produce cars better than others. Now, when he started, he started with the, with the, with the corporation called the Detroit Company <coughs> Uh, uh, Detroit Automobile Company. He was a minority owner. He got some investors to invest, which had the control of the corporation, and he got the right to manage the corporation. Now, with his minority stake, he produced the first design of the corporation, and then the controllers, those investors, put pressure on him to take the design to mass production. Henry Ford said, no, it's not ready yet. I want to first perfect the design. And they say, no, you should take it to production. And they started arguing back and forth. Eventually, the investors decided to close the corporation. Second attempt, it's called the Henry Ford Company. In the Henry Ford Company, again, he was the minority. And as a minority, and the, as a minority, he made the design. Again, the controlling owners says, you should take it to mass production. He said, no, it's still not ready. This time, the controller, the controlling owners, to replace Henry Ford with Henry Leland, changed the name of the corporation from Henry Ford Company to uh, Cadillac Automobile Company, and sold his own design with great success. <laughs> now, the third time, Henry Ford said the following, okay? Meaning, from here in, my shop is always going to be my shop. I'm not going to have a lot of rich people tell me what to do. <laughs> now, and indeed, in the third attempt, the Ford Motor Company, he insisted on owning control, a controlling blog. He had 52% of the corporation. This is the, 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 the company that eventually he managed to create one of the <coughs> biggest success ever in the uh, industrial history of the US creating the T, the, the T model the car, which is uh, all known, and I don't have to elaborate on that. But the idea is that we have someone who would like to pursue an idea. He would like to do it his own way. And in order to do that, he wants to own control. Now, here is our model. Our model is fairly simple, OK? We have the entrepreneur. He has a business idea. And he says, I want to do it my way. He doesn't have money. He needs investors to come in and bring the money in order to allow him to do it. Now, the investors who come in, they are afraid of agency cost. Because how do we know that the business idea is going to work? Maybe this is a lousy idea. How do we know that the entrepreneur is going to do it the right way? Maybe he's a lousy manager or whatever. And how do we know that we are going to enjoy the profit? How are we, do we know that, that it all is going to be the way we want to do it? So they have a lot of risks that are involved in bringing the money to the table. And between these two parties, there is asymmetric information. Asymmetric information as far as the idiosyncratic value is concerned. It's not easy to convey 
your strong conviction about the production of cars. And we can give many other illustrations for this idea. And the agency problem also is being uh, aggravated by the fact that you cannot truly know what's going on in the corporation in which you invested in. So how the parties are going to resolve that? They are going to create a contract. And the contract they are going to create, we're going to assign two rights between the parties, control rights and cash flow rights. Basically, either giving control to more control to the entrepreneur or more control to the investors, either giving more, ca more cash flows to the entrepreneur or to the investors, but they are going to assign these two rights. And by that, they are going to strike some balance between how much freedom we're going to allow the entrepreneur to pursue the idiosyncratic value and how much protection we are going to give the investors against <laughs> the agency problem. Now, when we think about this, we have to understand something very crucial. Okay? So when you think about control, control is important for you to do it your own way. If you want to maximize the ability to create your business ID, you would like to get control. But control also is important to protect against agency cost. If you want to fire someone or you want to close the business, you want to have the right in your hands. Now, the cash flow will affect the risk and return of the investors. If you give them more, you give them more compensation for that. And, but here, we, when we talk about risk, we should remember that risk doesn't mean only the business risk, but also the agency cost risk that is involved in entering the business. But whatever you give the investors, the part that the entrepreneur is getting would affect the compensation structure. And when you affect compensation structure, you, as, you affect the incentive to work hard and create value for the corporation. Now, when you think about these two rights, there are three important things that we have to remember. The most important thing, and I think this is an element that is lost in the literature and in the cases, some of the cases, those rights are a fixed pie. You can't enjoy the best of all worlds. Okay? It's a zero-sum game. If you have control rights, whatever you give to one side, you take away from the other. You cannot maximize both protection against agency cost and pursuing idiosyncratic value. If you give 100% of the votes to the entrepreneur, you reduce the protection of the investors. If you give the investor 100%, you increase their protection, but you decrease the freedom to pursue idiosyncratic value. Any division you can make, and we can divide control rights in many ways, not just by percentage. We can give a right to appoint directors to the board. We can give the right to appoint the chairman or to appoint the CEO, whatever, any combination that you think of. But anything you do is going to divide a fixed pie between two parties. So there is a cost for protecting minority, as there is a cost for providing freedom to pursue idiosyncratic value. The second thing we should understand about these two is that sometimes they are complements and sometimes they are substitutes. Sometimes you can achieve something through cash flows and not through control rights, and sometimes you can just pick which one you would like to use. For example, in the startup world, we all know that a very famous way to give control to the investors is by what we call staggered finance. You do not make the whole invested at the beginning, but rather you will give it along some milestones along the way. And the third thing is that these are not symmetrically valued by the investors and the entrepreneur. Sometimes when you give some protection to the investors, they would value that piece of freedom less than the value that the entrepreneur would have valued that. That's why we will see it going the other way. Now, what we can see once we see this picture, that in fact, every, and I'm saying it now, every ownership structure is just a different contract along a spectrum with the assignment of these two rights in different proportion. Take a look, for example, on the spectrum of control. On the left side, you have dispersed ownership in which management has, in fact, has control, but it is contestable. Go to the other right, to the other extreme, dual class. Dual class, it's, uh, it's a complete control and it's not contestable. 
And you can see, for example, private equity funds, they get complete control, but for a limited time, 10 years, and that's it. And controlling shareholders, they also get complete control once they own beyond 50% of the shares. Take the spectrum of cash flows. If you look on the left side, then in dispersed ownership, normally management will have a salary plus 1% to 3% of the equity. Go to the right side, controlling shareholders normally will own 50% of the cash flows as well. While dual class will own below 50% of the class. And private equity, they all work based on the rule of 2% and 20% of the upside. So different ranges, different arrangement of cash flows and control rights. So what we have here, we have a spectrum of ownership structures. That's what we have. But it's just different contracts. The investors and entrepreneurs will strike different deals, making different allocations of those two rights. On dispersed ownership, you have contestable control and very small amount of, of uh, cash flows. On the right side, with dual class, you have indefinite control, but less than 50%, normally around 40, 30% of the cash flows. With private equity, you have just 10 years with 2 and 20% uh, cash flows, and controlling shareholders is somewhere in between. You get indefinite control, but you have to invest also 50% of the equity. Now, once you get to see that, you understand that thinking about one structure as better than the other makes no sense. Because those structures will behave differently given the economy in which they are operating, given the quality of the judicial system, given the quality of financial markets and the ability of the capital market to monitor management and to monitor the performance of the corporation. So each of them will behave differently in different, in different environments. Now, in that context, controlling shareholders, in fact, you bundle cash flows and control. The controller gets the right to pursue idiosyncratic value and increase the size of the pie. And he pays the price of losing liquidity, reducing diversification, and investing in monitoring. The investors, on their part, they reduce the symmetric information between them and, and, and the entrepreneur because now the, the person in control must put their own money in the business, 50% at least. And they get to share pro rata whatever the idiosyncratic value is materialized or not. But the risk is the exposure to the control agency problem. That's the risk and that's the self-dealing and that's the issue that we're dealing here. But that's just a different type of a contract. No, remember that with dispersed ownership, investor will face the risk of management agency costs. Now, the implication is that if you think about that, then we should see concentrated ownership even in good low countries. And you would see that even when the motivation is not to consume private benefits of control. And when you think about control premium, it's not necessarily something that reflects expropriation of minority, but it could, could also reflect the value that the controlling owner is putting on his or her own idiosyncratic value. What does it mean for the law? Uh, it means that like many other things in life, we have to balance. While most of the literature is focusing and big chapters in every corporate law book, you would see it's about minority protection, this description miss the part that we have to balance that with controller's rights. Meaning, we have to find those, this elusive balance between, on one hand, allowing the controllers to pursue their business ideas, and on the other hand, provide minority shareholders with protection against self-dealing and expropriation. But it has to be a balance. And in that balance, we believe that the appropriate, at least in the abstract, the appropriate protection should be for minority against agency costs should be based on liability rule, while controller's protection should be based on property rule. I'm not going to get into all these elements because that's the job we left for uh, Asaf. I'm just going to talk about one part of it, which is the dividend, okay, which came out in Justice Kaboob uh, talk. Now, when you think about dividend and the idea of idiosyncratic value, think about the following. Now, 
What's the problem with idiosyncratic value? The problem is that Henry Ford believes he knows how to do it better. Okay? Think instead of Henry Ford, think about uh, Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs believed he can change the world. He tried to persuade the board, and they fired him from his own corporation. He didn't manage to persuade them he was right. It took several years later until he came back and managed to implement his own idea. So there is something inherent that's very hard to explain. It's very hard to explain to investors, they have to believe or not. And obviously, it's very hard to explain that to judges. Because judges, as we heard here, they are not experts in finance. They are not attempting to run businesses. So the same difficulty rising out of asymmetric information will be when you think about the judges trying to figure out business decisions. So we believe that the reason for the business judgment rule in the context of controlling owners is because controlling owners trying to implement idiosyncratic value ideas. And due to asymmetric information, judges are unable to do that the same way that investors cannot do that. Now, in this context, when you have someone trying to do that and is willing to share with the investors whatever the gains are created, then ask yourself, is this a Catholic wedding? Am I in a position in which I have to work all my life for the minority? Or am I allowed at one point to say, that's it. We had, we had fun. We had a very nice road up to here. OK, take your money. I'll take mine. We'll go separate ways. Because I won't implement the idiosyncratic in a privately owned corporation. Or because I'm tired and I want to retire. It doesn't matter. But it is not a wedding. It's not a Catholic wedding. Now, you can stop it completely, and you can stop it partially. And dividends is, in fact, saying, I'm not completely ending the partnership, but I'm just taking part of it as a dividend, reducing the size of partnership between me and you. OK, let's take part of it. You take your part. I'll take my part, pro rata, and we'll keep being partners in whatever left. When you look at that this way, assume we will take heightened scrutiny, as was suggested here. And we will say, OK, it was wrong. You should not distribute the dividend. Now what? OK, the money is in. And if the controlling owner would put the money in the bank, making 1% interest just for spite, OK, for, for, the, for, for the annoying the investors who were against that. OK? If you ask, he will say, no, this is a very, very risky times. The markets are shaky. I want to keep the, market, the money on the side. Maybe some opportunity will come in. Can you evaluate that without abolishing the business <coughs> judgment rule? You would never be able to do that, because it's the same thing. So making decisions over dividends, we have to see that the other side of it means that you have to give up on the business judgment rule. You cannot hold both of them. Because what does it mean to enforce such a rule? It means to interfere with the decision as how to allocate the funds that were not distributed. And that we cannot do. And indeed, as Asaf will show, issues about liquidity, which are, uh, that might create um, self-dealing problems in some other context, are not relevant to dividend distribution. Dividend distribution, you can distribute the money because you have leverage buyout, because you need to pay for your ex-wife uh, the, the settlement for divorce, or whatever reason you need to do, whatever that is. Then that's part of the game. That's part of what we accept as, as long as you do it pro, pro rata. Anyhow, I will pass it now to Asaf to take the uh, practical part of this story. Thank you.